Are you talking to me? I said, are you talking to me? Well, I don't see anyone else here, motherfucker. Shit. I was hoping for a nice quiet end to the shift. What do I get? Ken Dodd's bastard son, that's what I get. He's about as funny as a fire in an orphanage. But if I want a tip, I have to be nice to him. Bollocks to that. Hey, come on, you boring twat. The meter's running. Where to? Bye-bye, tip. All right, he says. Who rattled your cage? Drop me by the Holy Ghost in Netherton. The Holy Ghost Church. Please. Netherton. My old stomping grounds. God, it was a right dump when I lived there. That was years ago, mind. But it's worse now. Much worse. There were no drugs around when I was a kid. Yeah, a bit of weed. Everyone smoked a bit of weed, maybe. But no hard drugs. Not like today. I indicate and pull out. It's quiet in the back now. Let's hope it stays that way. Flag me down outside the crown. Picked up a few fares from there recently. All half pissed as well. I suppose the uh, landlord's got to do what he has to do to get by. Sneaking them in round the back. Corona on tap. Well, I suppose it's a big pub. And if they're sensible, they should be able to socially distance no problem. Mind you, sensible is the last word I'd use to describe knobhead in the back. I glance in the mirror and catch his reflection. He's nodded off. He must be, what, about 60? And with a gut like that, probably diabetic. The prick's ticking a lot of the at-risk boxes, I can tell you. He should be more careful. A coughing fit jerks him awake. I hope that's the Siggies. Yeah, it'll be the Siggies. Saw him stamping one out on the ground when I picked him up. I've got my Perspex screen to protect me anyway. Little gap for the payments. Got my windows wide open. Nice breeze blowing through the cab. Yeah, I should be okay. I'll be fine. Jane worries though. What with her being pregnant and all. Doesn't like me going out and mixing with all these people. When I get home, she greets me with a squirt of hand sanitizer. Not a kiss. She makes me strip to me undies in the hallway. Like the bleeding full Monty. Everything in the wash, even my jacket. I have to keep two metres away from her. That's the hardest part. Don't even get a cuddle. So yeah, she's not happy. But I have to earn a living somehow, don't I? Babies don't come cheap. And there's no furlough money for the likes of me. I was working with Billy when all this shit storm kicked in. Helping him out in his shop. At the weekend at Grady Market. 250 quid cash in hand. But now, now Billy's shop's boarded up. And Grady Market's deserted. City's like a fucking ghost town. So I had to do something. So I found this. It's all there was. Been doing it for just over a week now. 100 quid it cost to hire a cab. It's tough on Mondays and Tuesdays, but as the week progresses, it gets busier. And I'm my own boss. I like that. I start at four, work through till, well, whenever, really. First couple of hours are usually pretty good, what with the supermarkets being busy and that. And in early evening, a lot of the kids are out socialising. Teenage girls and up to the nines. Bottles of vodka in one hand. Meeting up at friends' houses. They think they're bulletproof, don't they? And then there's the NHS staff and the care workers. Badges proudly on display. Hoping for a free ride. I can't give them a free ride though, can I? Yeah, I give them a couple of quid off the fare. But I can see the disappointments on their faces. I don't see anything. I don't even try to explain. Soft lad in the back is dead to the world now. He snores gently as I trundle down Litherland Road at a steady 30 miles an hour. Well, saves on petrol money, doesn't it? We pass the site of the old library. Me and our Joe would come here every Saturday morning. Me mum and dad didn't have a single book in our house. Not one, not interested. 
but the library gave us access to a whole world that we didn't know. Adventures in the countryside, going on adventures and solving mysteries. Ah, Joe, he liked Biggles. But I was into war stuff. I'm still not. It's gone now, the library. A victim of austerity. Bulldozer away. There were protests. I even signed a petition to help save it. But they weren't listening, were they? Did they ever fucking listen? A row of neat little houses stands in its place now. Dickens Close, the bastards called it. Just to remind us of what we'd lost. I take the first exit off the mini roundabout and I'm outside the Holy Ghost Church. It's time to wake up Sleeping Beauty in the back. I pull over to the curb and bang on the perspex screen. Hey, mate! We're here! He looks around, bleary-eyed. Uh, just take the next left. Swift's Lane? Yeah, Swift's Lane. Bloody hell, I grew up on Swift's Lane. I drive slowly, taking it all in. Go past that old house, 145. Doesn't look too bad. Fancy blinds in the windows. Hanging baskets by the front door. Nice neat little gardens in the front. I'm surprised. Pleasantly surprised. What number, mate? Uh, 177. Just on the left. 177? The Roberts used to live at 177. Jimmy Roberts must be about, what, ten years older than me? He used to keep racing pigeons in his back garden and a loft. He used to drive me on bloody crackers, those pigeons. Circling overhead, shitting on a washing. Once shat on me dad's head, once. <laughs> what a laugh that was. Dirty little flockers, he said, as he went off to the shower. <laughs> My dad. He's gone now. Dodgy ticker. Survived two heart attacks, but I couldn't survive a third. The first one happened out here, just on the street. We're having a kickabout. It was me, my dad, our Joe, and Jimmy. All of a sudden, he just clutched his chest and collapsed. Collapsed to the ground, unconscious. His face turned fucking blue, I tell you. Ah, Joe, he ran and got me mum. She was hysterical. A complete wreck. No use at all. Me? I just froze. Rooted to the spot. Scared. Really scared. But Jimmy? He was calm. He knelt down beside me dad. Hand under his chin. Tilted his head back, pumped on his chest, blew into his mouth over and over till the ambulance arrived, all wailing sirens and flashing lights. They took him to Aintree Hospital. My mum went with him and she was calmer now, but still in floods of tears, you know. That was the last time I prayed. Yeah. Went out to my room, got on my knees and prayed. That survived. He had to be careful, like he had to take tablets and watch himself, but he lived for another 20 years. Oh, thanks to Jimmy Roberts. He was famous for a weekend. The Times came and took his photograph. The Bootle Times, that is. <laughs> He'd have to buy a pint in a Liverpool Arms ever again. Not while my dad was in there anyway. Which was most nights. I park up. 177 looks a bit more run down than the rest of the houses. Tatty net. Dirty windows. Yeah. He fumbles in his pocket. Trying to get the money. The 
meter reads 840. Not a bad fare to end the night on. Yeah, he says, passes me a tenner. I get a tip after all. And not a bad tip at that. I feel a bit guilty now. As I take the money from him. A single grain of birdseed falls to the floor. I look at him. I look at him properly for the first time now. Yeah, he's a lot older. He's not aged well. He used to have a mass of curls, but they're long gone. His face is lined and haggard. And he must be what? Five or six stone heavier. But it's Jimmy Roberts. <laughs> it's definitely him. As he clambers out of the cab, walks towards his tattered little house, I shout after him, Jimmy! He turns around and looks puzzled. I stare back at him. Thanks! I say. Thanks for everything! As I pull away, he shrinks to a dot. My rear view mirror. And then he's gone.